Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Iblis Manifestations Podcast. This channel features lengthy off-limits conversations with various different artists and entrepreneurs, predominantly from the underground metal scene. We take deep dives into the topics of life, music, spirituality and take insight from a variety of thought-provoking perspectives from personalities who you don't often hear from in a mainstream setting. I am your host Shayan and I was originally born and raised in Iran and currently reside in the UK. I am the frontman and founding member of the black death metal band Trivex who have been active since 2009. The band originally started in the Islamic Republic of Iran where such type of music is banned as well as a punishable offense. You can check the band's pages for any updates on tour dates as well as new music. I am also a personal trainer and an online fitness coach who specializes in people achieving the best versions of themselves physically and mentally. Having been someone who was once extremely out of shape and overweight I find it to be my duty to be able to pass on the information and knowledge which I've gained to help others achieve the same transformation. The Iblis Manifestations podcast also features a variety of solo episodes where I discuss personal experiences and anecdotes in a very candid fashion, covering everything from mental health, spirituality, philosophy and even paranormal experiences. This is the Iblis Manifestations podcast. To support it, be sure to subscribe to the channel and visit the link in the descriptions. It's great talking to you, Shia, really. And best of luck to, to your endeavors for this podcast. I think it's a great initiative. You're my favorite person to talk to uh, for interviews and stuff. So I love what you're espousing out here. I love the knowledge and the perspectives that you're curating through this and I'm just so honored to be a part of it. Thank you. As I told you, it was one of the most interesting interviews I've ever had because we talk a lot for a lot of, for a lot more things than just music and I really appreciate that. I respect you deeply and uh, it's an honor to be here. And friends, remember as always, better to die on your feet than to live on your knees. Enjoy the podcast. Rock and roll. How's it going, Andy? Welcome to Iblis Manifestations, man. Uh, hope you're doing okay? Doing great, man. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Yeah, it's my pleasure, man. Uh, very excited for all this new stuff that you guys got cooking for Bewitcher at the moment. Uh, I've heard a couple of singles that you had uh, out recently, and uh, I'm a big fan. Yeah, great fucking energy, you know. It's yeah. containing that pure heavy metal spirit, man. So uh, very, very excited to hear the rest of this record now, you know? Fuck yeah. Yeah, we're stoked, man. The uh, The new stuff is definitely... I don't know, without getting like too far down the rabbit hole, it's definitely like the last three albums combined. You know what I mean? Like, uh, how, how can we distill it into a silver bullet of just classic? Oh, there's another one. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I should probably warn the viewers now there'll be, there'll be uh, uh, cats making appearance from time to time. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. So for anyone listening, we just had a cat go across the screen, you know, and, and obviously, as everyone knows, I'm a massive, massive cat lover. And uh, I have two of my own right here that might make an appearance at some point. They might not. But uh, <laughs> so we've been introduced to Gus, which is the ginger cat. And what was yes, the name of the one yes. that just walked uh, past the screen? The other guy is Briscoe. He's my uh, tuxedo cat. Briscoe. That's that's fucking cute, man. <laughs> nice. So, so you were saying about the uh, about Anyways. the new album being the last few distilled into one. Yeah, it's like uh, I guess the whole point was how can we make in our in our vision a classic '80s heavy metal record, but through today's lens and w with taking like the cla like the last three records and just putting it all together because I feel like we every record we just keep trying to push out the boundaries of what Bewitcher is capable of. And I feel like this one 
definitely definitely does that and i know that's cliche as fuck but i think it's true so <laughs> no of course so it's interesting when you say that because i definitely felt like that the the vintage aspect of it was a lot more prominent you know especially mm -hmm. the video for uh dystopic demon demonolatry demonolatry am i saying that correctly uh, de de demonolatry yeah. Demonolatry. There you go. There we go. That's a, that's a new that's a, that's a that's a new word and a mouthful that I've just learned. You know, um, uh, by the time I go to sleep and the process of neuroplasticity happens, when I wake up tomorrow, I'll actually say it correctly. That's how our brains work. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. But, so what I was saying is that when I watched the video for that, you know, I could definitely feel. You know, it has that old school almost vhs type of uh mm -hmm. character to it you know that it's just like you know i can imagine being some young person in the 80s you know like 13 14 year old and then your cousin who's older gives you a vhs oh you should check this out and then you yep. pop it on and then there's the lines across the screen and then that video comes up that's the kind of vibe i got from it i mean that was totally it, it's funny because it was by accident you know we had this like grand plan of this huge music video and every and just with time and availability and and means everything kind of just keeps getting narrowed down and mm -hmm. when we were editing it it was like very apparent that that it just felt like something that i would have seen as a teenager you know what i mean mm -hmm. and and i love that because you know sometimes we have this grand vision and we see it through and sometimes things just are happenstance and they just happen but that to me was so perfect because it just ties into the essence of of what I think, you know, one of the elements of Bewitcher, which is um it's I I don't want to, you know, we are we are a forward thinking band, but I think in a lot of ways we're we're just stuck in the past. And that our childhood just kind of keeps coming through in all in all these aspects. So yeah, that video definitely when we finally got the final treatment, it was like, fuck yeah, it just it just had that, you know, like you said, you know, your older brother you know it's a million dubs and you finally get a copy of it and you're just like fuck you know that's it yeah exactly <laughs> man yeah it's kind of like a little bit of well a lot of those like early venom music videos mm -hmm. you know always had that kind of vibe where you were like what the fuck is this you know <laughs> speaking of venom i just i just saw them recently playing at beyond the gates and it was so fucking oh, yeah. cool man it was like uh, that was actually the first time i ever saw them and i was just like i can't believe they're still doing this you right, know right <laughs> yeah yeah it was I, haven't, like, I haven't seen uh, i haven't seen chronos's venom yet but i have seen venom inc and yeah you know, I, I feel like they've kind of had a little bit of a career like this in the last like 10 years but when we saw them it was probably i think we'd probably put out the first record or maybe the second record so it's like 2016 something like that and mm -hmm. we were just like you know just like holy fuck you know because there wasn't like a bad song it was like everything you wanted to hear from the great records you know what i mean yeah so yeah the you know the original venom is definitely high on the list for sure <laughs> yeah absolutely i mean venom inc are also great you know i just recently uh, met um tony demolition man you know and mm -hmm. what a mm -hmm. fucking guy his energy was like phew, you know like up here yeah, i was like yeah. fuck yeah you know it's, it's rare i don't know you meet a lot of great people but then sometimes you meet people whose energy is just like perfectly compatible with yours and it's just yeah, so refreshing yeah. when that happens you know and they're obviously great you know and you know um not not that this is necessarily a bad thing but for their age the way they're kicking ass you know um i think it's good you know i think venom fans should go and check out both venoms you know and decide for themselves which one they enjoyed so. more you know yeah man yes. i mean it's you know it's like uh it's it's not like a misfits thing where you're like on this team or this team i feel like venom is kind of one of those bands where it's like dude it's fucking venom dude <laughs> you know yeah I mean? like, yeah like demolition man does just as good a job in my opinion as chronos but i mean obviously the og you know but <laughs> yeah that's just my yeah. opinion no, no, I, I, I agree, you know, and that's obviously, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a befitting uh, compliment. And it's the same as what you were saying. Um, it's the same as either watching Morbid Angel or I Am Morbid live right now. You know, right, you get right. two really, really solid acts, you know, that obviously, you know, there's like a little bit of separation to it. But at least if you watch them both, then you've seen all of the members together, <laughs> more <Right>. or less, <laughs> you know? At some point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. No, that's really cool. So yeah. I, I just want to come back to like kind of like the time capsule thing that, that we were just mm -hmm. kind of referring to. Uh, it's very interesting to me that, you know, this whole movement of um, 
you know, uh, sort of encapsulating that old energy of heavy metal, you know, and the, the whole retro vintage thing. I think you guys do a great job of it, you know, and then I think, I guess, a very prominent example that everyone can probably think of probably would be Midnight. And then there's also our friends in Hell Ripper. They're doing a very good job mm -hmm. of that. And there's like lots of these um, new-ish bands, you know, that, that are born in the post-2000s world. Yet, yeah. You know, hold on to that kind of energy of the 80s. And I think there's something really fascinating about it. Because with metal, if you look back at it and, and the way it's evolved, it kept evolving and evolving. The quality of the production kept getting better. And mm -hmm. then a part of metal eventually at some point went into seven string guitars, super high production, super processed sounds and everything, you know, and, and that stuff sells very well. But for me personally, it just felt like it kind of got really far out from what it was originally meant to be. So yeah. I'm absolutely fascinated with the fact that there are bands such as yourself that kind of like to go back in time and embrace that old school vibe of priest motorhead saxon venom even like early bathory that kind of vibe mm -hmm. all mixed mm -hmm. in together why do you think that is why do you think we gravitate towards that specific style to preserve it i guess i think there was just a, a genuine honesty in that time frame you know or that timeline that that late 70s to the mid 80s um because heavy metal was still i mean it was starting start, obviously starting to blow up and become commercial to some degree but i think it's always been underground and it's always it's always meant to be underground and mm -hmm. really created for like the fans and you know as as we've gotten older and i mean this probably just goes back to just being an old you know i'm in, I'm in my 40s now so you know i grew up in the in the 80s and 90s so that was definitely mm -hmm. like my childhood and that childhood nostalgia but I think I think there's just something really great about records that were like not perfect and you could hear mm -hmm. flubs and it was real. It was a real band recording real music and it wasn't perfect and it wasn't processed and you know, you didn't fly in each individual note and and also like mm. I feel like nowadays there's this I mean, and this has been going on for 20 years, but this this need to out heavy everybody, you know, to be mm -hmm. more brutal. And I think there's just something so great about just that classic spirit of rock and roll. And, and that just comes through, uh, so well in those, in those records, you know, those Jewish priest records and motorhead records. And there's just something so, I don't know, you can't, it's intangible. You can't put your finger on it, but it's so fucking awesome. And, you know, I'm, I'm all for brutal and whatever, but it's like, fuck breakdowns, man. Just give me a fucking Judas priest riff. <laughs> You know, like <laughs> that's just me. Sure. And again, I speaking for you know. Once you reach four, you kind of like have a little more of a fuck you attitude <laughs> towards everybody who's younger. Yeah. So you're always like, it was it was always better when I was a kid, you know. So that's where we're at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but I think that that's that's perhaps part of it. But I also think that there's a lot of younger musicians also gravitating towards the same mm -hmm. sound. You know, um, what's funny about it is that like, uh, well, I don't, I don't know if it's funny, but it's just intriguing is especially in some, some particular places, you know, I think maybe Berlin's a little bit like that. Uh, London's very much like that, you know, where you have people that you, you like go to a pub and then there's some guy looking like Giza Butler wearing some fucking white top, trainers or something like that you know and then, and then it's just like you know i'm fascinated by that you know it's like our obsession to go back in time to find our mm -hmm. identity you know and i think it, it is it's kind of cool because heavy metal um as uh you know i had the legend himself on the podcast tom g warrior you know um i've referenced what he said on here a few times but he said that heavy metal is originally an attitude and mm -hmm. I fucking love that, you know, because it's so accurate. And I think part of it is just that attitude of, yeah, fuck progressing, fuck getting, you know, uh, modernized somehow. Let's just stick mm -hmm. to what we know, you know, which is quite primitive, but also powerful, you know, kind of like, yep. don't try to fix what's not broken. You know what I mean? Totally. I, I, I think like, again, there's just something genuine and real about that. There's something human about that, because again, you know, you've done episodes on AI and, and of course um, we can go down and, you know, we can talk about just 
pro tools and all these things that, I mean, all these things we have at our disposal to mm -hmm. make things perfect. And the more we do that, the more we take that human essence out of it, I think. And again, I think it's just getting old. Like there's something about like that nostalgia, you know, you, mm -hmm. you get, you're just like, I don't know, man, when I was 13 and I heard Metallica for the first time, like nothing was better, you know, like there was just mm -hmm. those moments in your life that are just so defining and you just kind of want to keep recapturing that. And I think, you know, as a band, like a band like Bewitcher, it's like, you know, we, we want to, our goal has always been to like maintain that essence and to tap into that, that rock and roll spirit. I mean, like, again, when we were kids, like the satanic panic was a thing, you know, uh, of course, yeah. like pa pa parents were still freaked out about, you know, uh, even like in the nineties, like Marilyn Manson and, you know, white zombie and shit. Mm -hmm. And so there's just something so great about that. So just. I don't know, just that feeling of rebellion. And so just tapping into that, but also we want to approach it from today's like abilities and and sound, but without getting too again, you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna go in and fix every single note, you know. Like I mean, like a fan may listen to the new record and to them it's perfect the way it sounds. And the, but you know, as as the artist, you know, you listen to it and you're like, oh, there's that one spot. I, I wish we would have gotten and fixed it, but at the same time, you're like, I kind of like that it's there because it's not perfect and it's not it, and it's not meant to be you know what i mean so there's yep. just something real about that and genuine and i and i i think i that's one of those things that i love about this band that we kind of always have have that that spirit you know and in, in a lot of ways you know it's kind of punk rock in a way too that kind of fuck the mainstream fuck modernity uh and that kind of seeped into this record as well you know that just just even in sound but also just that spirit you know which to me is like, uh, I mean, you can definitely draw that parallel to like all those early black metal records or, you know, like the, the pro or the pre black metal stuff that, that, mm -hmm. that punk rock attitude. And again, I love that. I love that connection, even though they're two totally different, you know, genres. And, you know, that's again, that kind of rebellious spirit that we try to have, you know? Absolutely, man. Uh, have you ever tried fucking around with analog recordings? You know, as a kid, I, I still have like uh, like a four track tape like recorder. Like you could actually plug in like like cool four tracks, and then you can bounce them onto the fourth track. And it, so basically, you got like eight tracks in theory. But uh, yeah, as a kid, I definitely did like early demos. You know, <laughs> just just trying to write stuff and and figure it out. But uh, uh, you know, we like in our early bands, we went in and you know we we recorded with like the DAT tapes and stuff. So we've done that before. I mean, mm -hmm. nowadays it's pretty much, uh, for the most part, impossible to find those, you know, those studios. So it's it's all Pro Tools and Cubase and whatever. But yeah, I definitely, uh, I definitely have messed around with that as a child. I loved it. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I think I actually know a place here in the UK in Wolverhampton that's got that. And because uh, we were just recording our new album uh, with our friend uh, Greg from Esoteric. And uh, he was saying that I think he has one, but he's just not used it in a long time. And I've always been really okay. fascinated with that. You know, I, what I quite like is just even the hybrid of it, because doing a full analog record, yeah, that would be near impossible, because then it's the mastering and the mixing being analog yep. and everything. Yep. That yep. That's a fucking, that's hard work, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and money, man. <laughs> you gotta have, and money, you gotta, yeah, yeah, you exactly. You gotta have Metallica budget for that kind of stuff. You know? <laughs> I know. I, I don't know if you knew this, but I, I swear I heard some somewhere that Metallica had something like, I think $30,000 budget just for Kill 'Em All, their first album. Isn't that insane? When, when you think of like, like what that number means today, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's like, that would probably mean, I don't know, like <laughs> maybe close to like 300,000 today, you know, just, right, you know, it's, right. it's a wild guess, but it wouldn't be far off. Now imagine having that for your fucking first record. That's fucking wild. <laughs> I mean, they totally well, deserved it and they nailed right, it, right, but still, right. <laughs> they were like 18, 19 year olds when they did that one. Oh man. I mean, and, and the music industry has just changed so much now, you know, like, of again, it's like, there's just something so great about that era. You know, there was, the money was behind it and that, and the fans just fueled it. And nowadays it's like, the labels are like, oh, well you just build a home studio and, you know figure mm. it out you know <laughs> get a get a focus right you know interface and and just use plugins and turn in the record next month like like fuck that man i want to go into a studio <laughs> you know i want to yeah. work with 
want to work with an engineer and like let's and let's make a record you know like like they used to you know but uh yeah it's funny uh going back to the 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 kind of analog approach we actually um when we recorded down in ventura california we recorded with armand from the band night demon and uh, mm-hmm. he's got a killer studio in ventura and he actually had just acquired an old um tape machine like like a straight up analog tape machine so we for fun we ordered like two or three rolls of tape and we recorded the record digitally but then he did like a mix where he sent it through the the right machine and then and then send it back so you have like like that sound um and i know there's like plugins that can do that but this was kind of fun it was like let's let's just do a pre-mix and then just send it through and see what happens and it's like it's noticeable i mean it was definitely like not the the finished product that we wanted but it was just kind of fun to go like oh so this this is what it would have sounded like if we would have done like a a, an analog tape recording you know so i would i would love to mess around with that more because it is it is pretty cool you know <laughs> what's cool about that is that it, uh, what, what I actually really like cassette tapes you know and uh, I wouldn't necessarily say I have a collection as such you know but I've got a fair few copies of uh, cassette tapes and part of that is because I really like the way that it sounds because what it does is that it actually slightly drops the the tuning or the or the pitch mm-hmm, mm-hmm, rather mm-hmm. for the <clears throat> for the full recording and that does this thing to us i think especially the drums uh, where it just makes it sound i don't know that it just makes it sound a little bit more pleasant in a way you know but that's why also if you listen to a lot of like the early black metal records like the mysteries for example Mm-hmm. And this is especially if you listen to a version that's been just like copied and copied and copied over and over. Um, and the guitars actually, if you play, try and play along to it in like a guitar that's an E standard, it sounds right. wrong because it's actually considerably lower in tuning. It's now. almost like yeah, it's almost like a half step down or something like that. Just yeah, or almost like a quarter step, I think. You know, yeah, and I think it was yeah. like the same with Dissection Summerlane as well because. Mm-hmm. Um, that album, if you, if you listen, if you listen to the digital version of that, it almost sounds like it's in F tuning. You know right? that? <laughs> yeah. I did not know that, but that's fucking yes. really cool. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's it, and this is something I love about tapes right now because we've we've always done tape releases for our records, and mm-hmm. uh, I, I think ninety nine percent of people who buy them at the shows don't even have the ability to play it, but it's just they just want a tape, you know? Yeah. And there's just and it and it's just cool, you know. Again, it's like. Like I, I'm kind of the same way. I don't like necessarily collect tapes, but I definitely have like a collection and I still have all my tapes from when I was a kid, like all the, you know, you know, pre playlist, you know, (laughs) pre Spotify Mm -hmm. playlist. Like when your buddies would just like, here's an Iron Maiden song and here's a Motorhead song and here's a Metallica song and you just put it all on a tape and just, just, you know, play that thing to death. But, uh, you know, I still got like my, my copy of Ride the Lightning from when I was 12 years old, you know, bought it. Awesome. That's cool. You know? Yeah. Uh, so there's something just, again, there's something just rad about that. And, uh, you know, you know, we can go on for hours about how cool it is, but, you know, I just think like nowadays it's, it's, unless you came from that generation, it's hard to really understand, you know what I mean? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Actually, I do think it is a generational thing and I think it's absolutely wild how fast things have actually progressed. Cause you know, if you think about it, the eighties were what? 40 years ago that's not that long ago really not really i mean (laughs) you know i know to someone who's thinking oh well that's like no but just think slightly bigger picture four years is Mm -hmm. not a long time ago this is what someone said that absolutely blew my fucking mind is that you know the year 2004 is just as was just as close to 1984 as it is to 2024 which we're in right now Right, and I was just right. like, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> and I remember 2004 really well, you know? <laughs> and it, yeah, exactly. It, does, it doesn't feel like it was that long ago, you know? I was having a no. conversation with, with a good buddy of mine about just, we were discussing the year 2006, actually, just just and metal releases. And we were just kind of like rattling off, you know, like Rain Chaos came out and, you know, fucking, I think it was uh, Now Diabolical. And like, we were just like, the list just kept building and we're just like, dude, 2006 was a fucking sick year, man. It was. (laughs) And when you think about it, you're like, that was 18 years ago. And it doesn't feel like that. Yeah. It really is. (laughs) Yeah. 2006 was really good because Monotheist came out. 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, that's. I think that's what kicked it off because I was talking about your episode, and I was like, that, that right. inspired me to pull that record out again. And I was like, fuck, this album is so good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, we just started like rattling off the, the the records and i think we even had like a text chain going on because he like looked it up he's like dude look at all these albums i'm like and it and yeah but you're right it is mental it, when you think about it you're like that feels like yesterday like it literally like i remember buying monotheist when it came out and it doesn't feel like 18 years ago <laughs> no like, no fuck. <laughs> and especially with with how he's kept the sound going since then you know because sort of like since that record came out i think you know he's kind of had that sound uh, and then sort of just evolved on it you know obviously the last Triptychon record came out like 10 years ago now which that's fucking crazy also to think about right <laughs> right yeah that's just it does, time seems to have uh flown obviously this is excluding the um the live in Roadburn that they did but still yeah. it's yeah. just it's insane but that's also to you know like to me i remember because um, i discovered metal considerably later you know and you have to think i was mm-hmm. also in iran when when i discovered metal so to me at that time when i would listen to something from the 70s and 80s that felt like i was like trying to decipher fossils you know it was like obviously right. those were the records i would listen to <laughs> but it just felt like it was from fucking ages ago and then when i think about it now it's like oh yeah the same the same amount of time that was between me and and listening to those records at that time thinking that Mm-hmm. you know that time has now passed since then <laughs> yeah <laughs> you man, know i mean it's insane I, I you know i remember discovering metallica and they'd only been around for 10 years you know like like that to me is mm. i still think about that and i go th- th- this band has been around for so long now but like i remember you know the black album had just come out and you know discovering them and just being like like this is my band dude fucking metallica and in and, and 10 years seemed like such a long career at that point and yeah now you look back and you're like i mean and, and they did a considerable amount of <laughs> uh, uh you know work in that 10 years but when you think of 10 years you're like it doesn't it seems like such a long time but it's really not like you said like the last triptychon record was 10 years ago and that and yeah. that seems like it that seems like an eternity right like we've been over here just like patiently waiting for like the next one <laughs> and it's like mm-hmm. 10 years just seems like so long now it's like fuck. <laughs> sure i mean you've had bewitcher for what 11 years now yeah, we're going on eleven years, man. I mean, two thousand thirteen was the was the inception. So, yeah. Which again, I I'm, I, you know, I look back on it and, it and it flew by, but at the same time, it's like we've done so much in that period of time. It's insane, you know, compared to mm-hmm. all the other bands we've been in, which just, you know, drug on and were stagnant for, you know, decades. <laughs> so it's and I it's imagine you, I imagine you're probably gonna be carrying that on for quite a while longer, maybe. Hey? I hope so. <laughs> yeah, you know we we've you know we've kind of got to this point where you know again this is just part of age. You just kind of get like disgruntled and pissed off, and you know, and like, like obviously COVID fucking like like fucked everybody, including us. So it's kind of this weird like mm. like starting again kind of thing after that. And but you know when you get in your forties, you definitely kind of have those moments of just like, the fuck are we doing, dude? <laughs> <laughs> but then at the end of the day, it's yeah. like you know I. I we we kind of have that collective dude we've been dreaming about this since we were 15 and like mm. the opportunity is there the doors are finally like you know opening um we've got the right team it's like how could we like ever stop doing this now you know what i mean we have to see this through kind of thing so yeah we pretty we feel pretty fortunate uh cons- all things considered you know with with just from the moment we decided to do this band, it seemed to, it just like, it made sense. Like we'd been beating our head against the wall. And then as soon as we are like, let's just do, dude, let's just like dive into our childhood and just combine Motorhead and Venom. And that was like the, the inspiration. Right. And it just was like, yeah, why, <laughs> why are we, why are we wasting our time with all this other shit? You know, let's do something cooler, you know? So yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I, I love hearing hearing stuff like that. And uh, of course, the band is doing quite well now as well. Obviously, you know, this will be now your, I think it's your second one on Century Media. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Technically, I guess you could think of it as a third in a way, just because we put out the comp last year um, of, of all course. the early demos and stuff. But but yeah, second full length. So yeah, yeah. Which is, uh, you know, again, it's just weird to think, you know, because I, Century Media was definitely one of those breakthrough labels for me as a kid. Like I remember getting a, 
uh, was like a sampler that came with some book in the 90s and discovering Sam Ayel and Tiamat and Sentenced and 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 I still have that and I still mm, kind of yeah. like you know like look at that and go fuck man like we're a part of that legacy now which is which is pretty incredible to think you know like yeah my again my 20 year old self would not have believed that we're you know we're doing that now you know it's pretty cool <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, lo I love those kind of perspectives. You know, I too have experienced moments like that, you know, where uh, where it's either something like, you know, you're either on the same label as some of your heroes or, uh, you know, because we just signed recently as well. And um, I think it might have, the announcement might be out by the time this episode comes out, but I won't say oh, it okay. just in case okay. it, it isn't, okay. you know. But, Understood. Uh, <laughs> and the, yeah, <laughs> I'll I'll tell you off the record, but um, yeah, and and you know it's it's one of those things. It's powerful. But then the, the strangest thing for me has been like bumping into someone who I've you know followed and pretty much during my teenage years idolized. Bumping into that person just to say hi to them, just to say hey, great show, man, and then them turning around and saying, oh hey, you're the guy from the podcast, right? And I'm right. like. Yeah, I can be if you want me to, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like what the fuck, but yeah, that's awesome. But I think that the, the power in that and the real gift is to never let the fan in you die, you know, mm -hmm. and I think that's, 100%. that's kind of where it's at, you know, the, the ones that will always, the true artists will always remain a fan rather than, you know, like I literally moments just before we did this, I saw a video of Frost from Satyricon front row at a Sodom gig in norway losing his shit and i love right. seeing stuff like that you know i think that's absolutely Dude, brilliant it's like uh you know i don't think it's any secret that i'm a diehard rain chaos era dissection fan like that's mm -hmm. like, that's my jam and we're in the that same boat there dude i mean uh, i mean sorry well i don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole but <laughs> of, a, of a perfect record that is but uh, you can if you I, want. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love that live video, and then you see the dudes from uh, fucking uh, uh, Niflheim, uh, Niflheim uh, up yeah. front, just raging, and you're just like, that's it, like that. And they're probably in their fucking you know late thirties, early forties at that point too. And they're like, I I love that lifer mentality of like, doesn't matter, man. You know what I mean? Like I like you are i think every music fan and every heavy music fan makes a point like like reaches a point in their life where they go like this is who i am and this will always be a part of my of my essence and i and i you know i definitely discovered that early on but i love seeing that especially with guys like that you're just like like these guys are legends already but then they're front row at <laughs> the dissection show just like yeah. You know. I think the I think the Gustafsson brothers are a perfect example of that. You know, I've yeah. bumped into those guys. I don't know how many times just at maiden gigs. You know, like right, uh, right. I, I'm sometimes if if Diz and I are maiden gig, obviously I don't know if they're still attending shows together. I don't know. That might be awkward, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't, but, I don't know the story uh, there, but I but I am yeah, familiar with your name. I don't. So. I don't. I don't know the <laughs> yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, we won't go into that, but it's, you know, those guys, like, I've seen them not just in person, but also, like, as so many videos, like, uh, you know, just ran, you know, sometimes, you know, you just like to go on YouTube and just watch random live videos of your favorite bands. I'm like that anyway. I love watching, watching shows on, on YouTube that are at least, like, in decent quality. Yeah. Um, even if they're not, you know, I just like seeing random footage of bands on online. Um, and, uh, you know, there's so many times where I'm just watching a show and then it's like, oh, yep, there they are. There's the two skullets. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, same with like Blaze Bailey, you know, he just like filmed one of his audiences somewhere completely random, I, like in a different country, n neither in Sweden nor UK. And then there's like mm -hmm. those two right at the front row. It's like, oh, yeah, there you go. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. <laughs> it is. It is. I really like it. I really like it. But I think it was uh, my friend, um, my friend Bezot, who who told me this, you know, and, uh, you know, it was like 10 years ago when we were having a chat about it. And he was like, the real artists will, you know, they might find their own platform. They might become someone who's obviously very highly influential and stuff, but they'll never stop being a fan, you know. I think the moment you stop being a fan means that uh, you've lost passion for what it is that we are all doing, you know, and at the end yeah. of the day, you got to remember that we're just sharing riffs. 
Now, whether yours end up creating influence for others, cr- end up creating like a big cultural movement, that's that's amazing, you know. But you still mm-hmm. have to find your own groundedness in that sense of, like you said, going back to that, like you said, the the early ride the lightning tape or or whatever, you know. You always got to find home in that somehow. I think. Yeah, man. I mean, there's times when like you know. I- working the day job, the grind, just trying to get to the next tour or finish the record or whatever. And it's hard because we're kind of in that middle ground where, you know, we're not, we don't make a tremendous amount of money, but when, you know, when we get out, we do okay. And, but you know, the rest of the time, like, cool. you've got to work your, you've got to work your day job. Right. And sometimes you just, you're just like, fuck dude, what am I doing? And then I'll put on like, you know, there's few records that give me that, that feeling and rain chaos is one of them. But like, honestly, like devil's blood, um no time of every time ever more whatever uh i'm trying to totally fuck that up but uh like i'll put that on and it's just immediately i'm like yes like mm-hmm. i'm on the right path we're doing the right thing and i love that feeling I, you know because sometimes you do get you know we're all human you you have a bad day and you're like fuck this and then you put on that that perfect record and and, and it hits you at that right moment and you just go fuck yeah i can't wait to get on tour again <laughs> i can't mm-hmm. wait to climb in the van and just fucking lug our amps around it's it's the best feeling in the world you know like the i always say like the worst day on tour is still better than the best day at your day job you know what i mean like mm, you're i you're like some, that that's cool yeah yeah you know what i mean like you're in some random fucking town a random country and after a while you know it, it all kind of looks the same like the same trucks especially in the u.s it's like it's always the same truck stops and it's always you know the venues are always shit and <laughs> <laughs> you know right but but I don't know. There's just something great about it. There's just some, there's just this feeling that you're just like, hell yeah. Like we're in fucking Cincinnati right now, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Man, and I, love that. I, I love that feeling. I relate to that so much. You know, there's, there's just this freedom element to it. It's kind of, it's hard mm-hmm. to, I guess, decipher this feeling or, or, or at least try and explain it to someone who's not experienced that. But, you know, even if you're in like the, in a very small band, you know, which I think we all were once upon a time, you know, even if you're there, it doesn't matter. It's just the feeling of knowing that you're on the road and you're, you know, I remember thinking this some years ago, because in my band Trivex, we actually did um, a small UK run. Uh, well, for the UK, it's probably big because, you know, there's only so many cities where it's appropriate really to go and play extreme metal shows. But, um, you know, it was like a small headline run that we did here. And I remember, and this was actually just before the lockdown. So this was March 2020 where we did that. Oh, wow. And okay. Yeah. And people did actually show up. It was it was amazing. They actually showed up. Oh, and uh, yeah, <laughs> I was I was actually very proud of them. And I, and I, and I told him that on stage. Um, and this is whilst, you know, like a week later, we all knew we had the virus and, and it was, and it was eating us alive, which was, uh, which was very funny, but it passed and then it was fine. Um, so yeah. my point was that I, there was a specific moment on that run where I remember it was like two or three in the morning and I was just like, you know, covered in like filth and, you know, in like, you know, in like leather jacket and like sports like like joggers you know like so this like complete mismatch still got little bits of like you know black paint on on the corner of my eye little bits of blood i don't smell the best that i normally do even though i'm actually a very hygienic person you know and i I take care of myself in that way (laughs) for sure (laughs) at that particular time on the road that wasn't maybe so much the case but there was something about it just walking through that services and then just being like the level of freedom and detachment that I feel right now compared to everyone else here is second mm-hmm. to none because there's something yep. about that. Knowing that you're there for your mission, for what feels good to you, doesn't matter if you're away from home, you know, and uh, obviously for me, I left my home many years ago just to do this, but mm-hmm. there's just something that about knowing that, knowing that you're there, you know, sharing the road with the boys, just to play music, just to do this weird, obscure thing that is so cathartic and so beautiful that um, that only you at that moment know how precious that really is to get to experience that. Dude, I mean, I got goosebumps. Like you nailed it. Like, like yeah. it, so many good points there. Like, there's there's part of it is all. It's like for for the average person, right? They'll never understand it. They'll never understand mm-hmm. what that real 
freedom is to to climb in a van with your buddies and tour, whether it's yeah. a long weekend or six weeks, right? Um, and I think that I think there there's still that that thing like they'll it's like you'll go to a uh, you know you're at the truck stop at two in the morning and somebody's like, are you guys in a band? And you're kind of annoyed because mm. you're like tired and you just want some coffee. And but then you're like, yeah, yeah, man, you know, we're in a band. And and then they're just they're the way their eyes just light up and they're just like, oh, what you know, and you're and you feel it. You're just like, hell yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, and they don't realize like like the grind that it is and you know, the <laughs> lack of sleep and and you know, just all the shit you go through just to play that fucking gig. And but then you're just like, yeah, it is pretty sick, actually. <laughs> yeah it could be, but, it's because but, it is yeah man and you, you also kind of uh, you know hinted at like the freedom like in my my opinion it is the last real true essence of freedom that i think at least i'll ever experience you know what i mean like there is something about when you are on the road your bills are over here you don't even think about it like you're you save up your money you work your ass off so your bills are paid and you just go and you're just you're on your mission you're on your path and uh, that feeling of like just it's like it's like floating it's like i you know i want to say free fall is not the word but you kind of just like step into the abyss and just go and yeah. that is the best there like you know and you can't you can't like fuck a bottle that up and sell it you know what i mean like and i mm -hmm. and i and i think that that's why we keep doing it you know like yes there are definitely days when i would love to just say fuck it and just <laughs> not not worry about it because being in being a creative artist is such a uh sometimes such a hard thing right to get that mm -hmm. record out to fucking you know just everything everything you yeah. touch you want to like put your stamp on and put your energy into and it's really really taxing sometimes um but it, it it's always worth it when you're when you're in that moment when you're on the road and you're just like hell yeah you know like we just did europe uh for three weeks this spring and lots of small shows it was definitely like definitely kind of a rough one but it you know you're in like dusseldorf and you're just like standing there outside the venue and there's some dude who's like man we came from belgium to see you guys and you're just like this is pretty fucking sick man i'm in fucking germany right now <laughs> yeah you know like i nothing beats that feeling you know so for sure no yeah. we're, we're actually very like-minded in that man you know um you know all of all of not just myself but the rest of the trivex guys are exactly have that same thought process you know mm -hmm. we just did um italy we played in frantic fest and um you know great festival you know we played like same day as marduk terrorizer and our friends oh, yeah. in darvaza so it was just like fucking perfect you know and just all the boys it was, just <laughs> yeah yeah and, and it was hot <laughs> as fuck as well you know and um right. yeah yeah and and that you know that it all adds to the experience you know it's like um that's why for some reason you know i mean me and my partner have talked about this but i struggle going on a normal holiday where i'm going just to be a consumer because i'm used to working you know and working right. isn't just for the sake of it, it's not just grinding for the sake of grinding but it's just having a purpose you know mm -hmm. to me i i i struggle with finding meaning in going to a foreign country or somewhere you know and don't get me wrong that's necessary it's good for you to rest it's good for you to spend time yeah. with people close to you it's 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 actually necessary to do that but sometimes um i just get an itch you know like i you know or if we uh, we travel to go to a festival just to see a show and then I, I after i've seen like five minutes of a band performing my you know i start getting an itch on my arm i'm like hmm that could be me right now you know or that that could have been me at some point later this evening you know and uh or or like if you go somewhere on a beach you know and you're eating lovely food or you know you're experiencing culture and it's like yeah this is good but when's the show gonna be you know and then there's no show right. and it's like it, it kind of eats away at you i don't know maybe maybe it, this is actually an unhealthy way of being but i've, I've just always been like that you no, I can't help it. I don't know if you relate to that at all. Uh, totally. I totally do. It's funny you, you mentioned that because I, so we leave for tour in like three, three and a half weeks. And um, mm -hmm. uh, I've been working my ass off at my day job and, and I actually have today off and I had this like vision of like, man, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to like, you know, cause the coast is about an hour away. I'm like, I'm going to get a hotel room just by myself, bring my book, 
rid of my computer, like turn, put the phone on airplane mode and just fucking just tune out. Cool. And it, it was, but it was weird because it was like, my brain was like fighting against me. Like I knew I needed to do this, but it's this, then, then that, that you need to get this stuff done and you need to, you know, it's like, it's like, you don't, it's like, you feel like you don't deserve that break. Like you need to keep yeah. going. You need to keep yeah, running. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like, so I've been like Absolutely. struggling with it and, and I, and I, like, I, I, I still haven't even like booked a room or anything. I'm just like, like I was looking at it before we connected. I was like, I just, just go like, why is this so hard? But, but it's weird because you just don't want to the that feeling of like resting and actually like tuning out is as imperative as it is. It's really hard. And like, I feel this, this constant compulsion to be like working on a t-shirt design or getting the, you know, the the tour ad mats ready or posting, you know, something, some bullshit to Instagram, you know, like, like it's just this constant need to be doing something for the band and keep pushing this fucking boulder up the hill, you know? And so it's hard to, it's hard to fucking walk away from that. So I totally relate, you know? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you and know, and the fact, yeah, sorry, oh, please gonna, carry on. I, I was just going to jump in and, and uh, you, you mentioned earlier, uh, like beyond the gates, like I went last year, and I definitely right. like had that feeling the whole fucking time. <laughs> it was just yeah. like, it's like, fuck man. I wish like, you know, you're watching, you know, somebody on you know, one of those stages and you're just like, you know, when are we going on? You know, when, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, like, when are we on next man? You know, like I, like that was the whole weekend was that feeling. And it was, it was like, really like, it's hard, you know, as a band, yeah. as a, as a musician to like, to not be performing, to be, to be at this sick fest with all these like-minded people. And to not be getting on stage, it's really weird. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, this, um, that's totally relatable for me, you know, and I had that when I was at Beyond the Gates, I've had that when I was at Inferno, I've had that at pretty much every festival I've been, you know, and even like, um, just a couple of weeks ago, I, uh, I was asked to join again on, uh, session guitars for this UK band called Deatus. And um, okay. they were opening the main stage at Bloodstock Festival in the UK. And it was a great show. I, I actually had fun playing with them, um, you know, and they're obviously good friends of mine. But uh, even after that show, I still came down and I was like, okay, when am I bringing Trivex back here? You know, because it's right, like in my right. head, it's an, it's an unstoppable itch, you know. And the thing is as well, just to clarify, when I say I'm going to shows and then I get an itch to play when watching other bands play, um, this is no disrespect to those other bands that are playing, you know, it's totally. not like the, the whole world isn't just about me and us, but it's more yeah. so, um, I think maybe it comes from a place of just wanting to prove yourself, you know, or, uh, you get reminded of, of what that feeling is like. So you want to try it yourself, you know, and then you want, you know what you can do when you're in that position. Yep. And, yep. um, and, and I think it's a little bit of a competitive edge as well, you know, and, and a real, real sense of just wanting to prove yourself maybe not to anyone there but to yourself you know what i mean totally. yep yep yeah 100 yeah because i mean it's definitely not a not a you know my band's so much better than those guys this is bullshit you know it's definitely yeah not that yeah bad. it's not that it's 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 more about yeah you just want to be a part of it you know you because again it's like you know it, it, those small little victories when you, you when the when the festival flyer comes up comes out and your name's on it you're like even even yes. if, even though it's like this big and you're on the bottom line, you're like, I'm the fuck, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's sick, you know. Um, right. It's just those little achievements, and so I think I think that's what it is, and it definitely is that personal, uh, uh, yeah, competitive, like trying to you just want to prove it to yourself that you can get up there and slay just like they did, kind of thing. You know, mm. like we've always kind of had a the mentality of, you know. I think I think we we're really good at like just making good friends with all the bands we tour with. But for that thirty minutes or forty five minutes on stage, it's like this is our stage. And I and I kind of yeah. so there is there is a little bit of that competitive thing with with uh with all with the other bands and all your buddies and stuff. But um, <laughs> and speaking of cats, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but there is you got to have a little bit of that. You got to have a little bit of that like you know for this for this moment we're up here to fucking conquer and you know after that it's like we're all bros again you know what i mean so yeah 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 absolutely man and that makes you perform so much better you know nothing is better for you as a band to play with bands that at least have some things figured out better than you do 
or have got more experience or, you know, or, or maybe like-minded guys that you get along with and then you watch them and then they maybe do something better than you. Obviously, mm-hmm. for us, this absolutely never happens, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's such a rare occurrence. It's, <laughs> it just never happens, man. You know, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but no, like, jokes aside, it's so good when you get that because, uh, you know, you've got two options. You either get pissed off. It's like, oh, why are these guys better at this? You know, or, oh, I can't believe they did better on this. I can't believe they did that. Or you say, well, what did they do that was better? You know, how can we yep. improve on our thing? You know, and I think that's so, so, so important. You know, um, and um, it's like when you when you when you're touring, you want to play with bands that you want to feel scared of going on after, or that or real, bands that real. you know. Um, you want to you want to make sure that by the time they go on, you know, like the crowd are still thinking about you. You know. Yep. Yep. No, it goes both ways. You know, I uh, I love that you mentioned that because it's like I think this has been kind of something we've we've actively done. Like we when we started the band, we definitely were kind of part of this new wave of traditional heavy metal circuit in the U.S. There was like the Frost and Fire Fest and Ventura with Night Demon spearheading that, and mm-hmm. all the bands you played with were you know predominantly American, some Canadian, and even they'd even get a, an, an occasional European band. But it was very. Uh, uh, Obviously, you know, your main staple was was Saxon and Iron Maiden and Judas Priest mm-hmm. and a lot of that kind of, you know, those those bands. And we were always the fucking Venom band, you know, like, yeah, people like that. People knew they liked us, but they didn't know why. And then and there was a little bit of this kind of like, I don't know, kind of kind of thing. And but we made a lot of really good friends and that really kind of helped us bust out. But then when the opportunity is like, hey, do you guys want to, you know, it was like after covid uh kind of and everything started kind of chilling out it was like you guys want to go out with exhumed and i was just like fuck yeah like that's Mm. totally left field from what we were doing with the bands that we were playing with and it was i think that was part of it was like let's get in front of an audience that has no idea what to expect from us has you know uh we're, we're not a grind you know death metal gore band um but it puts us in a in a unique position and i think you know when the next tour came out or came around and it was like we did municipal waste you know again totally yeah. different fucking uh audience and then the one after that was goat or incantation so i think we've like purposely done that because we like that that uh uh, uh challenge you know like let's put us in you know let's let's go in front of an audience that is is expecting this and we give them this you know and and go back to the beginning of the conversation like i love bringing that rock and roll into these environments you know uh like we're going out with skeletal remains and and phobophilic and uh yeah just doing this, like total death metal tour uh in a month and when we when we saw the lineup we're just like hell yeah like <laughs> i love it because it, it's that challenge and it's like we're challenging ourselves but also like i want to get up there and put on this like show that so by the time skeletal comes on people are just like fuck like i forgot what rock and roll was you know what i mean i'm so mm. used to just getting bludgeoned over the head with death metal and i'm just and, and i want to remind them like hey man like you know headbanging and just fucking that spirit of, of rock and roll is still alive and it rules you know <laughs> absolutely yeah, yeah i don't get the whole thing of like rock and metal is dead kind of thing you know i get that mm-hmm. a lot of it perhaps nowadays thrives on nostalgia you know but that's not to say that it's dead you know that's just to say that that's our our culture and we're rightfully experiencing it frequently you know and uh if you want to look at numbers and things as such you know certain things you could say it's even like the biggest it's ever been you know uh and and you can then discuss oh whether that's a good thing or a bad thing and you know if you want to be gatekeeping or not that's i think a little bit of a separate discussion for what you and i are talking about right now it's just purely just a preservation of the culture itself which i think is Mm -hmm. you know i I would say it's it's going all right to be honest with you there are some things maybe within our traditions that we should maybe stick to a little bit tighter just for the sake of the the newcomers that are coming in just so they understand Mm -hmm. you know um you know, because it's like heavy metal is a lot like a, it's a lot like a indigenous tribe. You know, there's like a, you kind of got to go through a few things to really get into it and really understand mm-hmm. it. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. And 
And I think that when it comes to being in a band, then you don't want to do a half ass job of it because the thing is as well, what's um, just because you were mentioning that, oh yeah, you still, you guys still have full-time jobs and stuff, you know, which, uh, which I respect that, you know, I think that's most, that's like 90, 95% of bands, you know, and like I said, right. a lot of bands that are successful, it's a lot easier to make a living out of being in a band if you're the main person behind it. So like if you're the only composer, it's your own project and then you just get like yeah. live musicians or you just get your friends to kind of help you out, you know, and, um, you know, but then when you've got three people, four people, um, you need a lot just to even make it a minimum wage job, um, you know, oh, and that, yeah. that's, that's, a, that's a fact, okay? That's a mm -hmm, fact. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing about it is that when you're working your day-to-day -day job, you know, like, it's like, I almost like that because it makes it feel like when you're on tour, when you're on the road, when you play any shows, or every time you release an album, you really, really, really had to earn those moments. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yep. And, uh, and I think there's something healthy about going to a job, even, especially if it's one that you fucking hate, going to the job and showing up on time and, uh, you know, and grinding day in, day out, counting the moments until the next show that you got to play, you know? I think there's something really yeah, powerful man. about that. Well, and it kind of teaches you uh, that self-discipline and, 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 you know, like, like with my job, my goal is always to be, I'm going to be the hardest working guy here. I'm going to show up on time. I'm going to bust my ass. I'm going to be reliable because I want to be able to leave for tour and then come back to a job, you know? It's like, I've, there's been a handful of times where I've come back for tour and not have a gig because I had to quit or whatever, but, but having a guaranteed job to come back to is like imperative in our line of work, you know? And so, you know, that totally leads into like, just the way I approach the band too. Like nothing is half-assed, nothing is like, you know, take it for granted or whatever. Um, you have to have that discipline to just get it done and keep showing up every day and keep pushing it, you know? Um, and yeah, I go back to like, just when you're, when you're at your day job and you're just like, like I'm a server bartender. Sometimes I cook, you know, the, you know, sometimes you're just sitting there going, God damn it, dude, this fucking sucks. And then, <laughs> but, but you always kind of like, you, you immediately think of that tour, that next coming tour. And you're just like, we're almost there, man. Just got to get through it. Just keep going. You know, like, like I'm going to be gone. Like, you know, we're, we're having like all this chaos at my restaurant, like every restaurant, there's always fucking bullshit going on and i'm just like i'm leaving i'm leaving in three weeks so you know if this place burns down while i'm gone i don't care <laughs> you know what i mean like like while i'm here i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna work my ass off and, and kick ass for you guys but when i leave like figure it out like 100 <laughs> you know? relatable man funnily enough i've also actually worked uh in that industry uh it's been years i'll, I'll admit but i I've, I've been in that bartender situation before you know or like when you're serving food and stuff just been, when you're like getting your first jobs here you know and uh i've done that and there's this really funny thing you know what what i think that's really good for the dynamic that, that we're talking about it's really I think it's a healthy exercise for the for the ego in the sense of mm -hmm. of just um you know cuz cuz you there's something about being in a band and being on stage in front of you know there's like even if it's just like 50 people at a small pub somewhere if the vibe and the energy is good there's something about that that makes it hard for the ego to then fit in with the rest of society and just be a normie afterwards but i do actually think this is as much as it sucks i think it's really good for especially mm -hmm. you know younger men to go through the experience of being treated like a quote-unquote rock star one minute and then being told to wash the dishes the next day i actually think this is really healthy you know i used to fucking hate yeah. it but I think it's it's actually necessary to put things into perspective for you and then say like, right, you know, because you, there were times I remember, you know, and this is years ago when I was obviously a little more more naive about the state of things and just like not quite as matured. And I would be there like 
pouring a pint for someone you know and i would be thinking to myself motherfucker you have no idea what i can do on stage you know <laughs> like right. and you're here you think i'm just some fucking bartender fuck you i can do i, I live a life you you have you would never live kind of thing you know but yep, these, yep. these little things that you, you know you kind of go through in your <laughs> little, head little petty moment you're just like fuck you man. yeah exactly yeah <laughs> but but i think that's ultimately I, i think that's actually healthy you know i think i think it's, it's good to go through that because a it makes you appreciate your art and realize that you know what you're doing is about your art and your message not because you're better than everyone else that's mm -hmm. very important to learn that as a young man the second is like i said that you understand that you have to earn those good moments you know and life isn't always meant to be good you if you're farming you got to plant a seed then you got to water it then you got to let it get sunlight then you harvest it if you were harvesting mm -hmm. all the time you'd have nothing so right. i think being right. in a band is a lot like that too Yeah, man. I mean, yeah, we're kind of working, especially the service industry jobs. It's such a, uh, you have, going back to the ego thing, you just have to swallow your pride a lot of times, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and my approach has always been like, hey, man, I'm just here to make tips. Like, I'm here to make money, right? And I can get all pissed off and bitch about this table or that table or, you know, this customer, or I can go like, hey, how's it going? What can I get for you guys? Because yeah. every dollar you give me, I'm putting into my band, right? I'm putting, I'm going to buy a new bass. I'm going to buy some new rig. Like, like there's a, it's, there's a means to an end. Right. And so Fuck I just yeah. kind of go, I just go, whatever, who cares? You know, it's just, you know, uh, uh, like a lot of the coworkers I work with, you know, it's just kind of like, I, one thing I've realized, man, is especially in the service industry, and maybe this is for most jobs. If you don't have something greater that you're, that you're working towards, like some type of like passion, mm -hmm. like, All you do is go to work and you just get so sucked into the bullshit and drama of that fucking job. And I watch these people and I just sit back and go, sorry, man. Like I, you know, there's, there's more to life than this bullshit job. Like mm -hmm. go out and do something kick ass with your life. You know what I mean? And I, and I, and again, being like, like not taking this for granted, I'm, I feel very fortunate to be able to be in a position where I can step out of that and mm -hmm. jump into the jump into the abyss for a little while and and just be free of it uh because it that shit will fucking destroy you you know just fucking depression and all this other shit like like if you got if you don't have something yeah just something greater than yourself you're working towards like it's it's ugly you know and i've and i see it all the time and i yeah i'm i'm just so grateful that we get to we get to just say fuck off with that shit You know what I mean? And absolutely. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Listen, that's so valuable. I, you, you put it down, you put that down really well. Uh, and I think, uh, I've experienced exactly the same thing. You know, um, I, I used to, you know, obviously I've worked in the service industry. Uh, I used to be the head reception at a casino for about three or four years, you know, believe it or not. And, uh, and in that place, you know, you're working in close, close proximity of a lot of people and uh you're working long hours you're working nights so uh people naturally get very close together there you know that's why mm -hmm. you know in that place like people had affairs whilst they're with yep. workers yep. there was a, there was some really bad cases obviously i won't out of respect for them you know i won't i won't like put all their personal shit on here but it's really fucking sure. bad you know yeah. but uh, <laughs> but <laughs> i think a part of that was just because You know, because you're working those kind of hours, you have no social life outside of work. And we as human beings are extremely social creatures. As yep. much as those of us metalheads who are misanthropes or whatever don't want to admit that, we are social creatures. Okay, yep. that's what we thrive on. And um, and when you live a life that doesn't allow you to have a social life and you've got no passions of your own outside that... It's almost like every day at work for you is like a new episode of a drama series. For and real? yeah, yeah, <laughs> that, it is, it is. It's like, it's like reality TV to them. And I can, I, I can only imagine how that translates in American culture, actually. So I, I would imagine because a lot of Americans that I've met always talk and act as if they're in a movie. And I hope this is, I'm not saying this in like an insulting way. It's just a right, general right, observation right. from a lot of Americans I've met. They always act as if they're on their camera and that their opinion is meant for the world to hear somehow, you know? So it's gotta be I wonder that, what that translates. It's gotta be that Hollywood like culture that we fucking grew up with, you know, because it's just such a, and, and, and I think just being American, we, we have such a, we're the most important 
you know, country in the world, like whatever yeah. kind of kind of attitude. And and this is also why I think it's so important to travel uh, at some point in your life because then you quickly realize you're not the most important guy and you're just another fucking you know tourist. You know what I mean? Yeah. So <laughs> it's it, it definitely sure. kind of puts you in check. But we definitely there is something to that. There is some there's some weird thing where you know our opinion always matters and you know we're so important and all this shit and it's just like. Nah, mm. fuck that shit <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. that's i think i think that's that's what i'm referring to and i'm not saying this is exclusive to america i think this is just totally. a human condition i'm just curious as to maybe the the fact that maybe the the, the sort of those kind of interactions are a little more exaggerated there um mm -hmm. but yeah i think that's also why because a lot of people listening to this they you know some of them will of course have their own bands but some of them might not or you know some of them might not necessarily have an outlet like that um anywhere mm -hmm. else other than the job that they do or or anything and then that that's why i think it's good for this kind of podcast to exist as well so that they understand that there's still like-minded people out there you know and then this is yep. still some form of a social exercise um believe it or not you know uh, you can look at it however you want but it's still this is some kind of a social thing so at least you know that it's not just you showing up to work being different to everyone else there you know and yep. then just thinking that they're all fucking idiots you know like there, there's there's more of us out here <laughs> who are who, <laughs> well, you know if, if, if that's all you're thinking about too that's not healthy either so no that's what i'm uh, saying yeah <laughs> you know, uh, no it's one of the things like you know like to like delve more into like in, into your show like uh mm. i i think my favorite episodes the ones that i've listened to that i connected with most are like the the recent one you did about sobriety and also just like the, mm. the health and fitness ones because that's something that i've really tapped into later in life now that you know again you reach 40 and you kind of like you know you at some point you look in the mirror and go all right man it's it's time to get real you know what i mean like like mm. i was never an athlete as a kid so you know my 20s were just raging and partying and listening to going you know listening to metal and going to shows and 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 then my 30s was like trying to get the band off the ground and now that i'm in my 40s it's like okay well you know if you don't start taking care of yourself now uh things will start to compound very quickly you know and it's and it's also just that much harder to make progress the older you get and so mm -hmm. I, yeah. I feel like I, I kind of stumbled upon your channel uh, like a year ago. And I, I want to say you had like an episode about like the fitness journey and stuff. And I remember just listening to that and just being like, like you said, like here's somebody else who's on the same journey who gets, you know, you're, you're, you're a little bit ahead of me on that, but, but I like totally connected with what you were saying. Mm -hmm. And I, and I love that. Like on one hand you delve into the subculture of metal and interview all these great people, but then you also put out those episodes that are, <clears throat> you know, just you rapping for an hour about sobriety and i'm just mm -hmm. like fuck yeah bro <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, i totally thank you very I much totally totally feel that you know because like you know this this yeah i mean when you're when you're doing this grind and when you're going to your shit job and you're just dreaming for that next tour it's easy to get sucked into those trappings man it's really easy and it's and it's it's cool to see that there's other people out there who are like who are having the same struggle you know what i mean mm -hmm. so well, thank you very much, man. That's very kind of you, and I, and I do appreciate it. I didn't realize you'd listen to as many episodes, but yeah, I, those are actually some of my favorite ones, you know. And uh, and and for context as well, you know, I've I've done exactly the same thing. My background is, you know, lots of partying and drinking and eating tons and tons of McDonald's when I was like in my early twenties, just not giving a fuck, not understanding that you know dopamine has a price. And um, yeah. you know what's funny is that when I was a kid. Well, I say kid, you know, pretty much for the majority of my upbringing, whenever I was in school, I was notoriously, I was always the kid who, um, you know, like, let's say if we had like a sport lesson, I was always the kid who would stop running and pretend to tie his shoelace. Right. Right. That was, that was me. I was not athletic. I mm -hmm. always skipped playing football or soccer, as you guys call it. I always skipped playing basketball. I skipped anything like that and instead I would either play chess or ping pong or if given the option I would play pool or something like that you know where sure. it was more intelligence driven rather than you know stuff that's like physically driven you know mm -hmm. um and uh, at least that's the way I convinced myself that that's what I needed to look at you know until I got older and then I realized that oh yeah shit so all these dreams like I literally got to a point man 
when I was, you know, so this is in 2017, I got to a point where I was so unhealthy at that time, you know, super overweight, constant headaches, constant depression, constant Mm -hmm. pressure and everything. And Mm -hmm. I literally like I, if we played one show, I would be gone for like a week, you know? And, um, and I was like, I have all these dreams of playing tours with Trivex, making it big and going out there and doing shows. And of course, to me, the art was the number one priority is to do the art justice. But still, you know, you have these kind of industrial ambitions as well, of course, you know, Mm -hmm. otherwise, you know, it's like, well, why are you doing it kind of thing? And I had all these ambitions for years prior to that, including at that moment. And I was like, I don't think I'm physically capable of doing that right now, you know? Mm -hmm. And that was a really hard realization that like that, re- that was like a realization that hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, I've come this far. I've left my home country. I've come here to play this music. And now I, I think that I physically destroyed myself to the point that I don't think I can even do that, you know? Right. And yeah, uh, man, I'm, yeah. that's, so that's yeah, why I had to, that's why I had to become an extremist about it. And it worked, you know? Uh, yeah, just, man. I mean, I, yeah. I think, I think to some degree, like, this is something that I wish, like, I, I wish was instilled in us, you know, as, as kids is, is, is that, that to some degree having more of a militant attitude towards your health and, and mm. because, uh, the way, the way what you eat and what you drink and the, the lack of sleep you have directly impacts your, your, your brain. Right. Um, yeah. uh, from like depression to just, just ambition and, and, all that shit and it just leads into procrastination and anxiety and and all that kind of stuff that's something i'm very like like very much learning right now because i definitely have like battled those things as well and you you have you you do you have to like Mm. at some point you got to draw a line in the sand and go i've had enough i'm fucking tired of this you know and for me it was like you know when we tour we go out hard like you know and again we're not in a bus we're you know we don't have a crew it's just like like we're finally at a point where we can bring a merch person, you know. So, so mm-hmm. a little bit of the heavy lifting is, is <laughs> you know, taken care of. But, dude, when you you know when you're fucking pounding tall boys of, you know, fucking cheap beer every night, and then you get on stage and give it like literally just leave every ounce on the stage for forty five minutes, it's so hard to recover. And yeah, and I and that's something I had to really like be honest with myself about because. It sucks. It sucks to get up there and and two songs in, you're like, fuck, so fucking tired right now, you know. <laughs> like just keep headbanging, nobody'll notice, you know. And uh and I, it's like, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to fucking get up there and crush it and then get off stage and go, all right, what else are we doing? You know, and, and not feel <laughs> that total debilitating, just like just lack of energy. And then and then be super hungover tomorrow, make an eight hour drive to the the next show and do it all over again. You know, it's fucking brutal, dude. And it sucks. And so yeah, I definitely am am tapping into that now, like big time. And you know, Mm -hmm. it's not always easy. You know, there's definitely days at work when you just you get off and you're just like fucking beer sounds so good right now. <laughs> but, no, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and, but listen, for the man. most part, you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> no, that's great to hear. Good for you, man. And, and listen, you know, I've, I've been there, you know, I've been in that place of just being so fucking, you know, emptied from the, from the experience of playing the shows and traveling. On one hand, there's something good about, you know, pushing the threshold of your own capabilities, but also you need to be well equipped, you know? So just, I think, uh, exerting yourself for the sake of it isn't really necessarily the way forward either, you know? So I think it's important that when you're not playing, that you're looking after yourself as best as possible. I think my general advice is reduce or eliminate alcohol, even if you really want to take it hard when you're not Mm -hmm. playing shows, you know, obviously a lot of bands and musicians when they're playing shows, What's up, Tisha? What oh, there we go. Sorry to interrupt, <laughs> man. This is Tisha. She's uh, she's my. I've I I've just been little... away for two weeks, and and I I, I miss this one a lot. That's How you your doing, house huh? panther right there. <laughs> That's my house panther. Yeah, the other one's somewhere here, probably fucking clawing the carpet somewhere. But right. uh, yeah, so. <laughs> 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 but uh, oh, there we go. She settled. But yeah, so uh, you know, I think that uh, 
it's important. Like my friend Bjorn, you know, he, he says it perfectly. You know, he says that uh, you have to be smart so you get to be stupid for longer. And uh, <laughs> and I think that's, that's, that's great. On. I like that. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Like and um, and that's the way to do it. You know, so, yeah, just try and reduce alcohol when you're not playing shows. And then what you want to do, just take up weightlifting, take up maybe some cardio as well. And yep. uh, even if you want to do like two, three days a week, that's still better than nothing, you know, and then that yep. gives you some stability, yep. so it gives you some resilience, gives you a bit, bit of an armor so that you can go through the grueling travel and uh, and the meeting all the different people because your immune system is so at risk when you're, when you're on tour, you know, and then you meet all these different people in different cities who fuck knows what kind of viruses and diseases they all carry, you know, and... Uh, well, and everyone and, wants a hug and everyone wants to be, you know, right in your face, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. So there's like no, there's no shit which is all, f- you know what I mean? Which is fine because you also... <laughs> Yeah. don't want to have a half-assed experience either you want to experience people to their yeah. fullest just like you want them to experience you in that way you know obviously within certain boundaries you know like you mm-hmm. don't want to you know be you know have like inappropriate relationships with fans and stuff but <laughs> you know like at the merch <laughs> table but like, you still i don't know what i don't know why the fuck i said that but like you st- <laughs> take it in the green room bro like <laughs> ah, yeah exactly but uh <laughs> But you still want to want to be able to be resilient, you know, and also uh, try and get as much protein as you can on and off tour. That's very, yeah. very important. And also protocol for when you're on the road, uh, get as much vitamin C, D and zinc as you can, because your immune system is going to fucking need it. So there you yeah. go. It's that easy. No. It's not it's not that complicated. It's just I, make sure to do those things. I appreciate it, man. Because, yeah, I mean, that's like like I've been I've been at it for about six months now, like on and off and. I feel like I'm finally like making progress as far as like the gym is concerned, but like I, a really good buddy of mine who's actually been sober for like six years and you know, like cool, nearly, nearly, you know, like, like if if there's ever been a dude that I saw who was this, this close to like death, it was him. And, and Mm. you know, six years later, he's like, we, we will talk about health and fitness and all this kind of stuff. And he always makes this great point. He goes, Hey man, as long as you're at the gym, that's still better than not going. Like if you decide to just do cardio this week, that's still better than nothing. If you just had to, to lift some weights today, awesome. Like, and I've, I've always loved that approach because I've always been kind of like a, you need to have a plan and everything's got to be meticulously, you know, Monday is this and Tuesday is that and so on. Mm-hmm. And I kind of like that approach of like, just going there and doing something is better than nothing at all, you know? And, mm-hmm. and it's and it's obviously infinitely better than drinking a six pack of beer to yourself every night. You know? <laughs> so like you're already on the right path. You know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, no, I was, that, I was that's how I that. started, actually. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's how I started, man. You know, when I first started going to the gym, I had no fucking idea what I was doing. So I would sometimes just go once a week, but that would only just be to prove myself that I can still keep going at this, you know, because I was fucking hopeless mm-hmm. when I started. I had no fucking idea. And I wish, you know what? I'll be honest, I wish I hire, hired a coach, you know, that's that's why I am working as a coach now, so I can help people, you know, um, you know, because I actually have full-time musicians under, under my wing at the moment as well, you know, and it's really cool working with them and, you know, just seeing the difference of, of how they, how they are, um, not just when they're on the road, but when they come back from the road, you know, and, uh, and just making sure that they, they sort of stay in that cycle of just being as much in shape as possible so that they can go through those really stressful um and uh, and brutal like tour schedules and things like that yeah, and um, yeah. i think that that's that's the important thing but i do think that having structure does help just because you get to you get to reap most of the benefits so i do think it's good having that but mm-hmm. also if you're just starting out, I think it's better to just instill the habit of showing up for yourself first and foremost, and then you can sort of look into what it is that you're doing. Because consistency yep. is the most important thing when it comes to that. Yep. That's definitely what I've learned for sure. You know, because I've been I've been like an on and off like gym guy for fucking my whole life, basically. You know, pay for a gym membership, right. go a couple times, and then you spend a year just paying for a gym membership, but you don't go back. And so uh, I'm definitely not like, like new to the gym thing, but it is like, it is refreshing when you like kind of approach it from a place of like sobriety and like actual, like, I'm going to start taking care of myself now because mm-hmm. yeah, I'm like I said, you know, you age quickly starts catching up and also just, yeah, I, when we get on the, when we get on the road, man, I just don't want to be like 
just physically dead when we get done. <laughs> yeah. You know, you get yeah, home yeah. after like a month and you're just like, I need like a week of just recovery, you know, my, like my liver hurts and I haven't slept, you know, like more than four hours every night for a month and it's fucking brutal. But, but, uh, you know, that's why we do it. Right. But no, it's, it's definitely like inspiring for sure. You know? And I, and I love seeing that too. Like, I, I feel like it's kind of a becoming more and more common in the music industry, just among a lot of the bands that we know and, and are touring hard and stuff. And you know, it, it, it might be a generational thing too. I think like, I think like people taking care of themselves is like in vogue now, you know, like the whole self care thing. So maybe, you know, that it makes it easier, but yeah, it's, it's cool to see. Cause it's not so much sex, drugs and rock and roll. Like, I mean, as much as we tap into like the nostalgia and what made heavy metal great back in the day, like you can't live like your Motley Crue in 1984. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like yeah. You'll, you'll fucking be dead, right? Motley Crue in 1984 couldn't live like Motley Crue in 1984. Right, you know? <laughs> right. It's, it, 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 <laughs> you look back and you're like, how the fuck did you guys survive, man? That makes no sense, you know? But yeah. I love it. I love that, you know? It's like guys like Ozzy and stuff who are still like, you know, such, so important, to, you know, to, to me and to probably, you know, to everyone in metal, right? And you're like, yeah, yeah how the fuck did you survive the 80s bro like let alone the 70s you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> just insanity you know the, the amount of shit that these guys got up to you know and we, we we don't even scratch the surface of it you know now it is it's funny i'm pretty sure that sabbath in you know in the early days like i think at one point they were going through like 70 grand's worth of coke each and like just try and do the maths on that you know that's like that's that's like that's more protein than I consume, you know, and that says a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jesus Christ, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, well, it's it's, it's it's fucking crazy, but uh, but yeah, there are, it's, it's nice to hear that, man. You know, and um, you know, and, and there's there's nothing worse than working all your life for your band, for your dream to come to reality and to get these opportunities. You know, I mean, we, we have to acknowledge getting the opportunity to be signed, mm -hmm. to do these tours. That's already like the first success. It's just the fact that the opportunity is there. Now you got to go and make the most of it. And nothing would be as much of a pity as not being able to give that hundred percent just because your physical well-being is in is an up to par, you know, that's why I think it's For so real. important. Yeah. 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 You nailed it, dude. Yeah. It's like, it, it's, it's like a disservice. It's not, and not only a disservice to yourself, but, but obviously at the end of the day, we do this so that some kid will come to your show to escape whatever bullshit he's dealing with or she's dealing with and exactly. just have that release. And if you're not showing up for that, it fucking sucks. You know, uh, one of the best, I think one of the best pieces of advice we ever got when we were out with Godor, we were talking to Ben and uh which if you haven't interviewed him i highly recommend that guy's like a, a fucking wizard dude just just his yeah. like like yeah i can't speak highly enough but anyways we were hanging i'd really out like to night. have them on actually i i've never had yeah. goat whore on this podcast but i would love to yeah yeah ben is like like one of those just world traveler guru such a smart guy um Mm. Uh, he's, he's just the grandpa of the tour in the sense that he like oversees everything. He's the tour manager. Everything's dialed. Everything's he's always he's always checking in with you. You know, he's just he's just so like on it. And cool. and you never feel like he's just like, oh fuck, this, you know, it's out he's all his his stoke level's always here. You know what I mean? And he's just cool. But anyway, I like people we like having, that. Yeah, he's great. We were talking to him uh I think it was like the last night of the tour, actually, and uh, in New Orleans, actually. And he made this great point. He goes, dude, you know what, man? Like there, you know, no matter how bad the shows or how bad the tour is or whatever, if some kid comes up to you and just wants an autograph or a picture, or just wants to talk for a minute, like give it to him because that moment will live with them for the rest of their life. Like you're not going to remember it because you do this all the time, but just think of when you were a kid and you met some band, right? you still remember that, like that moment. Right. And when you can give somebody that impact that, that like, Oh dude, I fucking met so-and-so from me with you. And they were so cool. And I got a picture. Like they're always going to think about that for the rest of their lives. And that is so cool. But it's also like, it's so important, right? Like to, cause I think that also taps into just continuing this thing that is heavy metal and passing yes. along and, and keep, 
growing the fucking you know the 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 fan base and the scene and the culture and and all that kind of stuff so i always thought that was cool man i mean i think we all i think it's one of those things that we all know but but sometimes somebody kind of like delivers it in a, in a such a way that you're just like yeah mm-hmm. you know yeah there are those days when you're tired and you know you're just getting punished by the fans and you're just like fuck but it doesn't matter like what matters is their experience what matters is that they that they go home and go fuck yeah dude look at this picture with me and so and so you know like that's cool because i mean i was totally that kid when i was 15 dude waiting outside behind the venue just punishing every band that came to town you know and Mm. but i'll always remember that and that definitely like influenced me and that that like was something that definitely was a cornerstone of why i do what i do you know and, and continue this so this fucking madness <laughs> this is absolutely beautiful man i like that thinking and i'm always very conscious of that as well um because you never know how far that person's traveled you don't know mm-hmm. you know like I, there's been times where i've actually met the few the kids uh, i say kids like literally almost kids or like teenagers who are at our shows and then their parents like introduces them to me saying that oh yeah this is their first gig so and so and I always try my very best to be as accommodating as I can with that because I know the impact that that can make um, early mm-hmm. on. Um, but also, you know, we always have to remember that us musicians, um, a lot of times, yes, we are doing this for ourselves, you know, it's for our own selfish artistic desires. But at the end of the day, we are in the line of work of creating memories, emotions and experiences. That's mm-hmm. all. So just got to keep that one in mind. You know? Yep, hundred percent, man. That's what it's all about, dude. You know, there's just nothing cooler. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing cooler than seeing that 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 band and just and you know you think back twenty years later, you're like, dude, that one show and like all the stars aligned and it was just fucking incredible. And I and I you know our goal is to achieve that every night. You know, to try and pass that along, that energy along. And I love I love when that you know when that happens you know and and you know 99.9 percent of the time you'll never know you know what i mean you just these kids Mm -hmm. they leave and they go about their lives but if even if as cliched as it sounds even if one of them you know has that moment then you you've done your job you know you got up there and you fucking played some heavy metal and and they'll go on to like i said continue this thing you know um and i mean that's it's rad as fuck in my opinion you know (laughs) absolutely man and that's what it's all about uh andy brother this has been a real pleasure to have you on the podcast man Uh, i really enjoyed having you on and it's been a really really nice chat um any final words for everyone i know we've got the uh new record coming up very soon for you guys spell shock yeah man uh well first of all thanks thank you for having me obviously big fan Mm -hmm. and 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 what you guys are doing but yeah, uh, we're going to be hitting it hard this next year and a half. So we got uh, North America in a month. We're, got, we're coming back to Europe this fall. We should have dates. Hopefully by the time this this premieres, we'll have dates uh, com- cool. finalized for that. We should be coming through the UK. So fingers crossed. Oh, great, great. So okay, that's good to hear. That. Um, and then next year, man, to me, nothing but touring. We'll be back in this. We'll be back to Europe in the summer. We got some stuff in North America in, in the spring. So yeah, we're going to be bringing it hard and yeah, just check it out. If you dig like classic heavy metal, please. <laughs> Absolutely, man. That sounds perfect. So it sounds like uh, lots of avoiding drama at work next year. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck work. <laughs> it's fucking going to work forever, dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Awesome. Yeah. I couldn't recommend Bewitcher to everyone. Uh, enough really you know great stuff and very stoked to hear the rest of the new record and stoked to see you guys when you eventually make your way down to the uk um also man look after yourself and to everyone listening to the podcast so far hope you guys enjoyed this one we'll see you on the next episode peace